So today we're continuing this amazing conversation in the entrepreneurial space with Leanne Kemp. Now, before I introduce you to Queensland's chief entrepreneur, I must first explain why I'm doing this interview and not Sarah. So Sarah grew up watching Oprah and in doing so wanted to be Oprah and she wanted to give out cars and do favorite things and all of that exciting stuff, jump on the couch. So this is definitely her laneway, skill set, expertise. But even though she made me sit through the 25 year box set I don't, of Oprah, I don't know if I can match her interviewing skills, but I'm gonna give it a crack because I have known Leanne for 23 years. So Sarah thought I might be able to probe and get a little bit more information out of Leanne than she would. <laughs> so over that time, I've seen the blood, sweat and tears in the geek world. I was there right at the beginning of her 20 year overnight success as I witnessed sleeping on the floor in the office, eating noodles and rice and giving away free monitors. To more recently, catching up with her in Davos in Switzerland, the home of the World Economic Forum, as founder and CEO of Everledger. She won an award at the World Economic Forum last year and the Technology Pioneer of the Year. Above, get this, Airbnb, Uber, Google, Spotify, and even Facebook. Ooh. Her extensive expertise in emerging technologies, business, jewelry, and insurance, she's pushing the boundaries, which she has done her whole life, addressing real world challenges through driving transparency and trust along global supply chains using leading ed edge technology. And the word blockchain is gonna come up, right? And I've take, it's taken me five years to try and understand what blockchain means. Even Leanne can't explain it, but I will ask her. It's this like woo woo thing. Leanne has won many awards, including Innovator of the Year 2018 uh, for, the, for women in London as an IT guru. And with so many tales and secrets to unearth, in the next 30 minutes. Let's take a closer look behind the curtain and see what makes her tick. So Leanne Kemp, I saw your schedule leading into Davos and I was even there to witness the madness in Davos as you sat on panels with Al Gore, got to hang out with Will I Am. You slept in a bed for one night in nine days because you flew all over the world. Simon Sinek says that the whole thing, everything we do is based on our why. So why the bloody hell do you do that? One <laughs> night in a bed in nine days. What the? Leanne Kemp, talk to us. Uh, I do it because I can. It's probably the most simplistic answer that one can give. But no, honestly, uh, I did ask myself a question a number of years ago. If I had the chance to relive the previous 10 years, what would I do differently and how will I spend the next 10 years? So the why for me is I'm being the change I want to see in my world and then in the world. And I guess, you know, I'm not far off 50 now. I'm punching my way through to an APS discount, which will be great because I'll get cheaper parking in Brisbane, but, um, and maybe even a couple of RACQ membership discounts for cheaper movie tickets. But in all seriousness, I think when you have traversed, you know, three generations of technology uh, innovation steps now, uh, you know, I've sat behind a keyboard for many of those years. I've been front facing and, you know, behind the scenes as well. I guess I have a patchwork quilt of experience that enables me to put this together and, um, you know, sew the canvas that will uh, be the picture of a picture of meaning for me. And if that resonates to a greater audience and solves things that are larger than the world that I can reach, then I guess that is really how I define rich. Wow. Not, I didn't tell you that she was funny. She's very funny. And I didn't, didn't know that how great at articulating and that tapestry of canvases that you wove together there. You just like over the last 20 years evolved in your descriptive nature. Leah, that's awesome. Well, you know, Nat, I am a lot brighter than I look. So that's often a secret weapon that I get to lash out. Um, there's unbiased consciences. You, you have said you're a lot brighter than you look for the last 20 years. So you are getting brighter, clearly. <laughs> well, yeah. so, so, you know, I've heard lots of people say, I want to make 
an impact in the world. I want to be the change. But can one person, like, can you do that? Can one person make an impact in the world? There are how many billion people, 700 billion people in the world? How, how do you think you can make a difference? Doing what I'm doing now. So I think that, it, you know, beyond sort of inspirational talk and articulation of vision, it's the willingness, the willingness and the appetite and the desire to uh, get on a plane and do what you have to do, uh, which marries to what you want to do. Uh, and if you've really got that patchwork tool of experience and you've built the, the memory muscle, um, then I guess you can do some of the heavy lifting yourself and then you can easily pass the baton across. You know, I've, I've, watched, I've watched you across five Olympics, Nat, so it's very clear that you know, there's a takeout in the psyche of creating, um, creating excellence um, and having the discipline and the strength of mind and the agility of body to be able to, um, you know, sleep upright on a plane or even sleep standing upright like a horse, which is sometimes what I'm like, actually. <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Yeah, my, one of my friends, we have to find, every time she goes missing, we know she's asleep in the toilet with her head on the toilet roll. So she's that busy. I imagine you'd be the same. So I must explain the setting Leanne's in. She's in London right now. She um, is like a digital nomad that these days we can take our work anywhere. So as you're hearing the clanking of the glasses, um, she's in a, a, a London, probably a members club, are you? No, I mean, it's even a bit more fancier. So Everledger has five operational centres around the world, um, which has geographical density in the diamond and jewellery industry and then coloured gemstones. But in London, we operate actually out of a five-star hotel. So we have the very best uh, of the bottom floor of the hotel, which we've converted into a fully operational office. And then on the ground floor, we have a restaurant, a cafe and even a bar. So we have beer on tap. And then above me uh, is six floors in... Um, in a hotel accommodation so I just get to actually just get to start the day at the top of the building and then literally fall my way through the floors <laughs> well that uh, that must be your model so your success model 23 years ago you had Absoft IT company um, RFID tracking see I do remember you were tracking um, food supplies and food wholesale food uh, and you had a restaurant underneath. So you've got this clear model that you need to be fed and hydrated so you don't have to leave the building. So it's good to see that it's continued. There's the secret, there's the secret sauce. But back then I was eating pizza, so not so much now. Now it's a bit more flavoursome with sushi and all sorts of other fancy foods. Okay, awesome. So um, you gave us a little bit there about Everledger and tracking diamonds, which is amazing. Can you just... Uh, go a little bit further into how that also is like humanitarian sustainability. So you've also got a cause for good in there. Um, how did that all start and, and share the whole blood diamond thing and how you're dealing with all that? So I guess there's a magic happens when uh, the collision of events occur in a most spectacular way and one thing that Everledger did well or I did well was just understanding the timing the timing of when technologies like uh, blockchain were maturing the challenges within the diamond and gemstone industry were also becoming heightened concerns and that we still had a memory uh, as far back in the 80s when Leonardo DiCaprio released the blood diamond movie um, so, you know, the industry is a pretty daunting industry. It's a 500 year old industry that still relies upon a gentleman's handshake, a chip of paper and a promise to pay. And, you know, the, the mass of that industry is still relatively consolidated. There are very large companies that exist in the world that command the powers of trade of industry globally. De Beers being one of them, Al Rosa, the Russians. And then, of course, proudly on the back end of that, is uh, Australia's very best Argyle mine with Rio Tinto. Um, but yet on the backdrop of some of the industry, we still face challenges in artisanal small scale mining. So this is not really, um, you know, with large scale mining companies. These are in places like Tanzania, in the Congo DRC, uh, in Angola, in Namibia, uh, in places in the world where you know, arguably children are mining. They're grabbing shovels, they're digging holes, they're finding gemstones and 
they're doing that because it's a balance that they need to provide sustainability for their own family in those communities. And yet there's a huge disconnect between these rural communities in these countries that are emerging, that are educated now, that do have access to communication devices such as mobile phones, yet they're excluded from global trade. So if we have the ability to marry this technology, to bring transparency, to provide traceability and some assurity around the source of the diamond, and then can bring a give back system into those communities to enable a better education process, or even actually one of the success stories you'll start to see come out of Everledger this year is the marrying of 50 Tanzanian women miners that have been excluded globally from the fairness of global trade. And, you know, I'm taking my leadership team tomorrow into India and one of our guys is then immediately flying out to Tanzania to help connect across Everledger these 50 women miners that can be legitimised uh, in Tanzania with mining permits and trading permits and connecting those gemstones, Tanzanite being one example, out into the trade so that these women miners are able to trade legitimately with uh, direct uh, wholesalers or, or consumers or even retailers in, in first world countries like Australia and Canada and the US and, and in the UK. So we're making a huge change. Um, we're bringing transparency to the once opaque, but we're also enabling a fairness um, in certain countries in the world where there's just been a depression um, and a repression uh, of rights and um, it's about time that changes. So if, if I can um, trace that, excuse the pun, because that's what you do, um, are we going to see then Tanzania women become millionaires overnight because of the, you know, that I'm sure they're in poverty and then all of a sudden they can sell a gem to first world people at those prices. Are we going to see that like happen instantaneously for those women? And Shameless their families? for you because your thought process goes straight into being in the heart of Switzerland, one of the richest countries in the world, and you often think about the motivation for people is to become rich and a billionaire. The reality is these women are not thinking like that. They're thinking about the education process for their children. They're thinking about a fairness of their young daughters being able to access education. They want to see a better world um, uh, in the communities that they live and that they thrive. So, you know, if I, the work that we are doing is a legitimate sort of set of work and even just giving them the basics of infrastructure, they don't think about becoming millionaires and billionaires like first world people do. No, I get that. And thanks for calling that out. Um, but that is what's going to happen. Like the price of a diamond or a price of a gem that we pay in Switzerland, if that's what they're collecting, they, they, that will just change their world overnight, which is... That's great. You know, cool. that's, we're, it, the world is changing and so should it. You know, 1% of the world's uh, wealth is held within the hands of, you know, uh, only a, a, trusted number of, uh, a trusted number of individuals or corporations in the world. So, of course, that's why we have diversity. Perfect. Spread the wealth. I love it. Rain all over the world. So... Um, you, you said something a little bit earlier, which um, some people may or may not have picked up. It started with you, right? So this whole thing started with you. And I've watched you over the years when you go to meetings, um, even though it's just you, you would say we, the royal we or, or Everledger. And it's like, I say, I used to say to you, who is Everledger? And it was just you in the beginning. And then I met Carlo and at Davos and I went to Carlo and I, I poked, first poked him to see if he was real because um, then your company grew to you plus Carlo and tell us about, like he told me a great story, but he said, you tell it better. So tell us about how you obtained your first staff member in Carlo and how he became part of Everledger way back sort of six years ago. Well, Everledger started in April 2015, so it's not even six, it's not even four. In fact, it's uh, three and a bit years old. I was in the heart of London uh, understanding and working, um, working on this idea to bring transparency to an opaque market and starting with diamonds. Um, and the truth of the story behind Everledger, of course, is that there were 
there's a previous business that told me that I wasn't capable, which was always a great way to start a challenge in my eyes. So boy, am I capable and nor am I stopping until it's over. So clearly that's a motivation there. If you pick that up, that's a driving force is, what would you say your driving force is? Uh, to show the future possible uh, and what can truly be created. To who? Well, firstly to myself. And I think that, you know, you get to a point where you understand and maybe you scare yourself in your own capabilities, but then beyond that, there's always something incredible in a Haley Comet moment when you get to experience that flash of light and then realize, wait, hang on a minute, there was more to that cosmic encounter than just actually a blinding light that went past at the speed of a bullet train. So I was the guy, I was in London back to Calajero. He uh, reached out to me just randomly on LinkedIn and came into the London office and produced a deck, a typical deck that you would see in most consulting companies that gave a vision for his world that he thought might resonate with me. Uh, and that was in the traceability of wine. And at that time I said, I'm not really sure that I care about this to be honest and sent him on his way. But in true Calajero fashion, he was just passionate and understood and really resonated with the approach we were taking. Um, and of course the purpose um, that I sort of put forward and that I was living. So being in London, he was actually in Paris. And I remember the very first time he pinged me on Skype and then would say, hello. Uh, and the two or three hours went later on in the night and it was one o'clock in the morning and he'd be like, hello. And this went on day after day after day. The guy had so much persistence, it was insane. And he would just continuously communicate me time and time again and reminding me of life balance to take walks, um, to enable the blood to flow through the veins and then to recalibrate, you know, the synapses in the mind. And, but you'd uh, never met him. You've never met him at this point. Oh, yeah, had one meeting. I had one meeting. Okay. And the rest of the time was completely a digital engagement. Okay. Uh, but I did know. He just said to me, I want to come and work for you. And I said, no, not yet. Not yet. He's like, well, it's impossible. The amount of things you are doing is not possible with just one person. I said, no, it's all about the timing. So, you know, you think about it, uh, a startup or a scale up and a true entrepreneur, a brilliant entrepreneur, it's not necessarily only about, you know, building the team or the funding or you know, the product. Yes, all of that is the mechanics of building a good business. But one thing that you have to do incredibly well is the timing. And you have to be able to choose the right time at the right moment to bring the ingredients together. And uh, for me, I think that's what we did well, was we just did timing incredibly well. So back to Carlo, then he, he was digitally um, hanging out with you and then he, he shared that he got an opportunity. So the timing must have been right. What happened? Yeah. You need to ping him back. Ah, this cool. So a couple of things happened. I mean, I got, a, got an email that just came through from uh, two things, actually. I got an email that came through from Klaus Schwartz, uh, who is the chairman and the founder of the World Economic Forum. And to be honest with you, I had no idea what WEF was. So I sent him an email saying, um, WTF, WEF, <laughs> do I care? Question mark. And he came back and said, Leanne, yes, you care. It's the World Economic Forum. Yes, you must go. You have to go. And that really started uh, the journey with the World Economic Forum. And then about a week after that, I also got an email from Google who invited me across in a female founders program um, to present Everledger to Google. And it was at that time I said, well, hey, I can't just really go alone. They're paying for two tickets. Why don't you come with me? So he came, he jumped on a plane and he rocked up and we did the whole Google dance, which they were incredibly excited to hear and have then always supported Everledger since that day. We've had the ability to work closely with the Google X team and we currently do even to uh, this moment in time. And the third kind of remembrance I remember was then the day that we received an email from Allianz accepting us into a big presentation for an insurance company in Paris. And it was on this day that I physically couldn't make it to Paris. I think I was in Australia and there was no possible way um, I could even swim there in time, let alone get on a Qantas flight in time. So I said to Carlo, please, will you go for me? And he said he practiced, had to practice in the mirror, in the shower. He repeated time after time the presentation that I gave about Everledger. 
And the funny story was they introduced him and Everledger to the stage as a female founder that the presentation will be in English and she doesn't speak French. And poor old Calagero walked out on stage, uh, a bearded man speaking French, <laughs> and then just let it rip. And the rest is history. He's the first employee of Everledger and is still here today. We just celebrated his three years in the company. And he said something quite amazing. He said, I was the first person to arrive and I'm the last to leave. Mm, awesome. And how many, so he was the first and you talk about timing and introducing new staff and like those decisions must be um, tough to do. And as you scale up, um, how many of you got around the world now? So year one, Everledger was just me. Year two, we grew when Calagero started to 20 people. And year three, we grew to 80. And this year, we'll take ourselves out to about 150. And we operate in five geographical locations. And the biggest challenge for us this year will be to uh, tackle, tweak, and even tease China. So let's see what we can do in mainland China. Well, Carlo spoke French for his uh, meeting in Paris. And so you'll have to clearly have to find a local Chinese that you can send in on behalf of you. Um, you talked about female founders and Google inviting you there. And by the way, Google X are projects that the world is not supposed to know about, they're inner circle projects. And I, actually you told me about that and you said, look, this is confidential, I'm doing Google X. And I found a real Google person and, and there are like 150,000 Googlers that work for Google. Uh, that might have grown, but that was at the time. And, and I said, oh, do you call them Googlers? And she said, yes. And I thought I was just making a joke, but they do. And then I said, oh, my friend does projects for Google X. And she went, oh, as if to say, you're not supposed to know about that. So for all those out there now, that's, a, that's the stuff we're not supposed to know about. Back to the female founder, because this is interesting. There's often women's awards and, and female awards, just like in sport, there's female athlete of the year and that sits separately to the athlete of the year and the males get upset there's not male athlete of the year because we all get thrown into one and then the females get this special treatment and Serena Williams is famous for saying she doesn't want to be known as the greatest female athlete in the world she wants to be known as the greatest athlete in the world so that Leanne is that important to you is that something you want to transcend gender and be able to be I mean you clearly do now you sit on those platforms with the Airbnbs and the Ubers and most of them are male yes yeah look I don't think I get this question a lot and I just don't walk in the room thinking I'm I'm here today as a woman and then I'll experience my art my science and my craft for me I just don't lead out with gender so um look I'm hopeful that we will not be having these conversations just like Jacinda Ardern, you know, when she of course is a pregnant prime minister and yes, it's novel that uh, we've had her give birth whilst in power. But the reality is let's hope that this is the norm and this is just the way that it rolls and flies. Um, for me, I just stick to my knitting and we can, you know, enable the changes that we want to see. And I just don't lead out with gender. So. Awesome. Great response. How long do you think it'll be before that question's not asked? Let me answer that first in that when we played beach volleyball, our, our leading question was all about the bikini. And it took about 15 years before they stopped asking about the bikini. So how long do you think it'll take? It takes leaders like, you know, like you, like me, like Jacinta Ardern that just says exactly as I've said, that we don't, we, it's not about our our identity in success is not linked to female being the pre-noun. Mm. So it's actually the responsibility of all of us to enable that conversation to be said, heard. Um, and then I'm quite sure, you know, your daughter won't be, won't be uh, leading out in these questions. And so if you don't necessarily prod the question in this way, then you're not going to get the answer that um, everyone is sort of seeking to find. Perfect. That's twice you've punched me in the face now. Good. Once for Tanzania millionaires and twice for using the pronoun female. So let's see if we can get a third out before we're done. How have you changed personally and maybe in business? How has your personal development um, evolved over the last 20 years going through what you've been through? Um, I've, I guess... Uh, I guess I found uh, my true north and I believe that the magnetic forces that sit around me 
in the skills that I've learned and the people that I've uh, met along the pathway. I just have faith that even if the needle moves a little bit to the left and right, that I'm still actually heading in the right general direction. So I've uh, found a sense of peace um, in the pathway is really where I've, I've come. I think I've found myself to be a little bit more pragmatic uh, in how I respond to crisis, uh, but I'm still revenge driven as a human being. So, you know, I can get, I can get that. Um, that's okay. That's for my misgiving. So I'm revenge driven and I love chocolate. So I've got to have vices somewhere. Swiss chocolate. I'll send you some over. I'll bring some back to Australia for you by the suitcase load. Okay. But I haven't lost the hustle. I still love the hustle. I'm still very curious. I have a curious mind and I still want to play with the things that are often um, incredibly complicated. I like to bring them back to their most potent formulas like I did with blockchain. And then once you can break those down to the very basics of understanding pure ingredients, then the alchemy of all of that being rebuilt again can then transform, transform industries, transform people, um, transform opportunities. And we do this now and we've seen this gastronomically in food. You know, who would have thought that you could have a salad that would taste incredible with, you know, strange ingredients as like, you know, duck and watermelon and apricots and almonds, but it works. And quinoa and kale. Yeah, so I think I've, you know, got the alchemy of life right right now. Awesome. And like I did promise at the start that you might, in 25 words or less, explain what blockchain is to the world. Sure, I can explain that. So I think, you know, blockchain is next generation uh, data based technology. So it uh, really is not new. It is uh, takes the formation of technical disciplines such as a database construct. Uh, it connects consensus, so multiple people can run across the same data uh, database uh, construct, uh, agree amongst the parties on the submission of data, and securely stores that with a layer of cryptography. So it will enable uh, construction of a business network and bring trust to the internet. So we are moving from what we once knew was the World Wide Web to the worldwide ledger because the internet was never formed with a view to understand uh, trust, trust at a level when it comes to transactional exchange. And that's what this type of technology helps to transform. Boom. That's good. That's the clarity. A few years ago, you couldn't explain it like that. So even that has changed. So that's awesome. Okay. We're running out of time. I'd love to have you back on another show. Um, I better not put you back in, um, powerful women's category we're just going to do powerful people and so i want to go a little bit on entrepreneur we just um you've mentioned a few characteristics but if you had to say what would your top five characteristics be to becoming a successful entrepreneur uh purpose led firstly so there has to be a why a big why a why that transcends the what and the when and the how and it's a driver, whether that be, um, and often it resonates back to some emotional anchor, whether that's occurred, you know, through a life event, some people will run into an innovation to help solve for cancer or leukemia because they've experienced that in their life. Um, others like myself, um, you know, were, were impassioned by transparency and trust because I think it's a important personality trait that I hold very closely to me. I'm a person of principle and I've often fought on that principle which to my lawyer they love but to my bank account sometimes was a really dumb idea <laughs> um, I think then a tenacity the ability to go beyond resilience I think resiliency is an overused word in entrepreneurship and you need to build anti-fragility and I think you know as an athlete you would understand the difference between being resilient and building anti-fragility so you know the muscle strength that's needed and sometimes you need to break down the muscle to enable it to rebuild into a more strengthened role and so i think a true entrepreneur understands that it's not just about taking a hundred hits a day uh to build resiliency it's actually about learning from that and building the memory muscle to make it stronger and then enable the synapses to fire uh, and bring those together um, and then outside of that, the rest is mechanics, to be honest with you. 
And sure, you've got to have a brain and you've got to understand skill and you've got to understand how to deploy. And to really scale as an entrepreneur, you've got to be people, people orientated and build a, a really cracking team. Mm. There's, there's a lot going around now about um, mental health, right? And back in the day, my coaches would, would have said there was only one mental and that was mental toughness. And then it sort of is now balancing the mental health. So as you build your um, anti-fragility and your tenacity, how do you make sure your mental health is in order? I mean, it's, it's lonely. I spend a lot of my time traveling between locations. And I think that the time that you gain in the silence of your mind is probably the one of the most important times where you can, um, you know, have, have the moment to be able to reflect on the decisions that you make. And I think, you know, there's so much in the world that is anchored on success or anchored on the external look of what looks to be successful, but to take peace in the journey and to understand that to achieve the heights of um, the heights of any mountain or to sprint the marathon, which is pretty much what it takes to build a business at scale, you will have to go through the highs and lows, but that, that builds this strength in not, you know, this, it builds the strength in the mind to understand that um, some of the things that we concern ourselves with are, are first world problems that um, taking the time to form a mind balance um, and then put it into uh, into constructive reality uh, is probably the most important mental health um, procedures that you can go through. And then also physical. I think um, to be able to, you know, you don't have to run five kilometres every day or do 10 push-ups in the morning. There's the physicality, the act of movement, whether that even be brisk walking or for me, I bought a scooter, an electric scooter, I literally scooter into parliament when I'm in Brisbane. And it's just the freedom to be able to have movement is also something that I think gives the oxygen to the brain and that uh, enables you to be able to sort of reset, reset your mind. But I, I speak about mental health and mental balance uh, a lot. Mm, awesome. So we hear great ideas all the time. Why don't all great ideas work? Well, because then they're not a great idea, really. I mean... But why don't entrepreneurs... There's so many entrepreneurs and they're all in these, you know, spaces and but not all of them are successful. Not all of them make it out of the bucket. It's like crabs in the bucket, right? It's why? Timing. It's timing. timing. It's the timing. timing. It's bringing all of this together. It's the timing of the market, the timing of the team, bringing the team together at the right time. It's just timing. Mm. And often entrepreneurs talk about exit, like damn um, straight. That's people, a real entrepreneur. Yeah. So that's when you talk about the exit. How do you know when you're ready to exit as an entrepreneur? And how, like, do you plan that at the beginning? Like, in three years, I'm going to exit, and these are the people I'm going to exit to, and you spend the whole time working towards that. Like, share the exit with us a bit. Well, there's two exits as a founder. The first exit is you out of the role of being a CEO or a C-level executive. And at what time can you grapple with your own ego to let go? And not a lot of founders or well-versed entrepreneurs even admit that to themselves. Um, and certainly I have, because there's certainly parts of the journey in building a business where you need to get out of the way of yourself and you need to enable the team or better people to come in to take it to the next level. Um, you see this, you see this in extreme climbing. You see this with Sherpas helping, you know, uh, climbers get to the top of Everest. They don't necessarily, um, they don't necessarily, necessarily do it in one great big stint. You know, they know how to pace, they know where to base camp and they know when to reset the oxygen tanks. And they also need, they also know when the best, um, second guide uh, support line comes in and the second part is the physical exit that's less about the entrepreneur to be honest with you the exit out of the business uh, when you talk about trade sale or an IPO is actually the timing of the maturity of the commercial opportunity that you've been that you that you've bought about by the company existing so often the two get intertwined and they shouldn't be intertwined but they should actually be what is the right timing for the company versus what is the right timing for you as the entrepreneur and look if it coincides together which it does in sometimes 
um, then great. Otherwise, sometimes it coincides and it's, um, you know, it's too early. You've probably left too much value on the table um, or you've exited not at the right value and you've stretched the company to a point where if you bought in a, a different set of leadership team, you might have been able to have advanced at a, at a better level. So, you know, this talk about exit needs to be separated. The exit of the entrepreneur slash CEO slash whatever and change out the right management team versus the physical exit of the company. They're two different drivers. Cool. So I'll finish with this question because um, we've run over time, but I'm in enthralled. So I'm sure our listeners are too. Um, Queensland. Now, for those of you that are listening all over the world, you can, if you don't know where Queensland is, it's the heart of Australia. Not necessarily in the middle, but it's a heart. We love it. We've been there Damn our whole life. And what you, as chief entrepreneur of Queensland, you just mentioned you scooter into parliament. Sometimes they don't let you in because they think you come off the street. But what is your role there as chief entrepreneur and what do you see for Queensland over the next 10, 20 years? So it's a premier appointed role under the Minister for Innovation. So that's, of course, with the Honourable Kate Jones doing an incredible job. And the previous minister in the role of innovation was Leanne Enoch, uh, who's now the Minister for Environment. You know, 10 years ago, Queensland was known as the smart state. And it was very clear that we coined that phrase uh, because of the DNA that sits within Queenslanders. We have incredible universities. We've brought together science and innovation in a way that's transformed bio and medical science. And of course, you know, we've seen a number of other innovations that have taken us globally. The government three years ago recognized that the smart state um, is in its, its next sort of tenure and that we need to advance innovation uh, to ensure that we are moving from a commodities-based uh, economy, uh, particularly with sort of, you know, rare earth extractions, coal-based economies, where we need to rethink this at a number of, uh, a number of levels, and that Queensland is well-placed to really advance into, in terms of exports and service and knowledge economy. And so 600 million has been afforded under the constructs of the current government, sits across an administrative line with Advanced Queensland, and that is being deployed out in ways to advance innovation, create the startup ecosystem. And my mandate is to think about how do we uh, scale up? And I like to think about that in such a way that we can find the very best of Queensland's talent. Combine that with the very strength and heart of our corporates that exist not only in Queensland, but across the world. You know, I'm in London today. We have an innovation centre here with the Commonwealth Bank of Australia. We also have Rio Tinto in London. There are a number of incredible, credible companies that are Australian and Queensland companies that stretch across the globe. And how can we connect the ecosystems together to show Silicon Valley that if you've got an entrepreneur that's from Queensland, we take the very best of the purpose-driven innovation that solves for problems that are bigger than ourselves and that we really are exporting smart ups. So we combine the smart state and startups. Smart ups. Smart ups. I love it. I, I love it. And for our listeners who are all chasing their dreams and their own goals and visions for their own lives, is the sacrifice and all the hard work really worth the rewards? Why? It's the why, Nat. Just mm. ask the question, the why, because it survives beyond, you know, the weather, whether it's, a blue sky outside or whether it's raining, you get to choose the mentality of whether you're enjoying the journey. Gold, Leanne, that is gold. Okay, so we are going to say goodbye to you so you can get back to work. Um, in yeah, because I've got a, you know, there's these three, there's really important things with the United Nations called the Sustainable Development Goals. It anchors the importance around, the, you know, where we're at in climate change and sustainability. And I've got a hashtag. So... Instead of the SDGs, we are GSD, getting shit done. Boom. High five, my friend, all the way from London. Over and out to all our listeners. I hope you've enjoyed this. Uh, Leanne Kemp, Chief Entrepreneur of Queensland, global innovative. Um, I'm not going to put in female award winner. She's just global innovative winner, champion. And it's good to see you winning your gold medal in this space. Leanne, over and out. 
Love your work. Thanks for the memories.